Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman alongside Morgan Campbell making our television debut officially, so we'll ring the bell for that. Now we've been extra loud for the TV extra debut. loud. Yes. Now portions of this show have been on television in the past, yes. but this is the first week that in full you are seeing us seeing us on television. If indeed that is the medium that you're watching us on, you can also listen to us on iTunes at the iTunes Store in podcast format, and of course on Podomatic on, on, on Podomatic as well. Anywhere where you can find podcasts, yes, and on YouTube, on YouTube. as well. But. Now that we're on uh, the silver screen, so to speak, we're on uh, we're on television. Let's get to the televised boxing from last weekend. We had two cards on Showtime and on HBO, just like the old days, uh, yeah, exactly. and just like the old days, the, the ratings were split, uh, basically fifty fifty. I mean, HBO got about they peaked at about eight hundred and twenty thousand. I want to say eight hundred fifty thousand. Right. Showtime somewhere in the six hundred thousand range. Um, we'll start on Showtime because I think there's a, there's a little more to discuss there. Yes, although there's plenty to discuss. About the uh, Matisse Postal fight as well. Uh, I was relieved to see that although Adrian Broner decided that he was a new man yes. leading up to this fight, that he was very much the same guy. Uh, I enjoy watching Adrian Broner. I love his antics. Uh, and so when I saw him come out with Migos yes. and dancing with the chains, and when I saw him not change his style whatsoever in uh, stopping. Habib Alakverdiev, by the way. Yes. We had it right the first Correct time last week. pronunciation. When I saw all of that, it made me very happy that Adrian Broner is still Adrian Broner. Yes, arrogant Adrian Broner. Every time an arrogant athlete comes along, whether it's Adrian Broner or um, like Yassiel Puig in baseball, people complain, especially crusty sports writers and gripe that this guy needs to have more respect. Um, he needs to be less arrogant. He needs to, one, be humble and it's even better if he is humbled if someone or something or the game does it to him. Um, and what happens is when 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 arrogant Adrian Broner, when Yassel Puig uh, stops being arrogant and starts being humble, they also become very boring. And then you get just what you ask for. And then they say, well, we're the great personalities in boxing. Well, every time one comes along, you guys sit there and complain. You want and to pacify to, him. Right. Yeah. And try to get him to be like everyone else. Um, you know, until he, yeah, his personality just becomes so neutral and so vanilla that he's not interesting anymore. So I, yes, was glad to see, because humble Adrian Broner is, arrogant Adrian Broner is un, insufferable, but humble Adrian Broner is insufferable and boring. Correct. So I'd rather be insufferable and fun and see insufferable and fun. Like the the Bruce Jenner joke that he made at uh, the horrifying. end of the fight. Yeah. That was the longest set up for a botched joke for the lamest joke <laughs> that he didn't deliver smoothly um, <laughs> and a joke that should never be made ever but except he's Adrian Broner and and if he was in a sport uh, that more people cared about <laughs> he'd have been in big trouble yeah, he'd be he'd, fine yeah. he was in a sport that had a league even a Jim Gray by the way and Jim Gray sometimes when Jim Gray gets offended he just takes the mic away yes. and throws right back to Mauro Ronaldo this didn't phase Jim Gray whatsoever well, Jim, he saw nothing wrong with Jim this joke Gray he chuckled was, along and just let him continue he was complicit in it this, yes. this was no different from Jim Gray at this point and it's funny about Jim Gray because he got such adulation and, and admiration and support from journalists when he took that hard line on questioning Pete Rose. Hey, Pete Rose, did you gamble on baseball? But recently, he's just become, you know, a mean Gene Okerlund. He yes. is completely complicit. And if you're in Toronto um, and if you follow me on Twitter, and you know, I like Barry Davis from Sportsnet. I hate Muninori, Muninori Kawasaki and what he's become in this shtick where Barry goes and interviews him and the butt of every joke is that Muninori Kawasaki doesn't speak English very well. Ha 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 ha. Funny. Um, it's th They're not interviews. They're setups. And Barry sets up the joke and then the punchline delivered by Kawasaki is that Kawasaki's English isn't strong. Ha 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 ha. But Jim Gray at this point is no different. This was not too far removed from Barry Davis and Kawasaki. Uh, you know, but at least the, the Adrian Broner shtick. Outside of that, outside of when it's offensive, yes, it, it, it's, it's still entertaining. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, you know, to your point about people trying to tear Broner down and trying to muzzle him, so to speak, they seem to decide that because he's arrogant, that that's the reason why he's failing in, in some way. And, and they make that decision about a lot of athletes. Yes. And 
you know, there are a lot of boxers out there who spend their money on ridiculous things, who go out to the club, who, who behave in the way that Broner yes. portrays himself and is very open about uh, about his lifestyle. A lot of people live that way. A lot of athletes live that way. That has nothing to do with the actual problems that Adrian Broner has inside the ring. The fact that Adrian Broner goes to the club on Saturday night doesn't make him throw 35 punches around <laughs> right. as a junior welterweight. Right. That, that, those, that, you know, I know you want to make that well, you want to make that connection by saying well because he's in the club he's not training hard enough so he's not in good enough shape he's not focused and so he doesn't throw enough punches but we're, we're, we're tying a lot of things together that yes. don't necessarily connect and you don't know what he's doing when he's not in the club of and, course and as we discussed last week so much of what has made adrian broner marketable is the fact that he uh, puts himself out there and he markets himself on social media and i hate to break this to you guys um, a lot of what you see on Instagram and even on Twitter and Facebook isn't a true reflection of how all your Instagram feed lives their lives. I'm sorry to break that to you guys. Uh, sometimes your friends pose the shots of the perfect cup of coffee. Yep. Sometimes that with, happens. With the heart. The, <laughs> yes. There's one in Morgan's cup right now, in <laughs> fact. There it is. Yeah. Exactly. So when Adrian Broner, you know, Instagrams himself out at the club doing whatever. Uh, that might he, that might be what he's doing for 20 minutes out of his life. That doesn't mean he's not in the gym the rest of the time. And it doesn't mean that that's what he's doing every single night of his, no. his life. Well, and that's the thing because, you know, Floyd, when he was still an active fighter, yes. portrays the very same lifestyle. But exactly. because, uh, A, because he never loses, and B, because there's always a produced reality show surrounding yes. him, we know him to be one of the hardest working athletes in the world. But Broner could work equally as hard. We've never really had that kind of access into Broner's camp outside of what he produces by himself for about right. billions. We don't really know. And, well, and again, so much of this is based on you know what our ideas uh, of a boxer are and what the ideas of what a boxer should be doing are. So we think of fighters as living this Spartan existence. Um, and we think that anything uh, that goes against the idea that light fighters live a, a, a Spartan existence uh, necessarily takes away from what they can do in the ring and, and takes necessarily takes away from their ability to prepare themselves to fight, even though there's really no evidence uh, that that's what happens. Again, Manny Pacquiao. Jet sets, sure. Karaoke's, yeah. Sings in concerts, yeah. Doesn't stop him from preparing for fights, <laughs> right? Has concerts planned directly after the fight, <laughs> right? You know, so how is he supposed to train <laughs> when he's getting a set list ready for tonight, right? So, and, and there, there is also a lot of, uh, 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 you know, an inability for a lot of fans and, and journalists to to distinguish between correlation. And causation. Adrian Broner is arrogant. Adrian Broner loses every now and then. Adrian Broner must lose every now and then because he's arrogant. Even though there's plenty of humble, hardworking fighters who also lose, sometimes you just lose. <laughs> right. This just happens. Right. It has nothing to do with your level of humility. Well, that's a, that's a decent segue into um, one of the craziest boxing articles that I've oh, read in, in a very long time. what just happened? What? Just this very moment. Cam F. Awesome, follow me on Twitter. Oh, perfect. Cam F. Awesome. I we mean, need, right now. Oh, okay. Yes. We, we need to get Cam F. Awesome on this yes, program, by the way. He's the wonderful guy. <laughs> yes. Um, Go ahead. But one of the craziest boxing articles that I've, I've read in, in a very long time. And, um, you know, we, we've talked about Thomas Hauser on this broadcast before. But in general, I don't want to, you know, people are out there working hard and they're learning their craft and whatnot. So I, I, I don't want this necessarily to be a forum for blasting other right. people who, uh, who cover the sport of boxing. But... Connor Rubush's article on Bad Left Hook, yes. uh, which was titled About Bullshit, uh, pertaining to Adrian Broner, yes. uh, is one of the worst and uh, most tone-deaf articles about the sport of boxing that I've read in quite some time. Yes. Uh, basically... Agreed. On all counts. And without summarizing the entire thing, effectively, to, to summarize a, a portion of it... Yes. Connor decides that because, in his world, racism doesn't exist anymore, that Adrian Broner and other slick black defensive fighters don't need to fight in the manner that their forefathers, such as Charlie Burley and Hallman Williams and, and, the, and the, the fighters of the Black Murderers Row, they don't need to fight like them anymore. So, you know, in post-racial America, right. in Connor's world, 
you better knuckle up and stand and trade, boy. That that's basically <laughs> yes. my takeaway from that portion of the article. And there are a lot of crazy things. Racism is over, so the defensive minded fighter is obsolete. Yes. Is what is is one of the points uh Connor I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Roy Bush is making, which is sort of like saying to uh, uh you know, and often you'll hear me make this analogy between pitchers uh, baseball pitchers and boxers, because both of these groups, you know, there's different ways to get the job done. You can be a power pitcher, you can be a finesse pitcher. But this is like saying uh, to pitchers, well, because we're in the age of, you know, the 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 six and seven man bullpen, you have relief pitchers. So there's absolutely no reason for you to pitch to contact anymore. Pitching That's to right. contact is for back in the old days where you had to pitch nine innings of every game. But now that you got a bullpen, it's your responsibility. Uh, to try to strike everyone out, and if you run up 125 pitches by the fifth, fifth, fifth inning, well, who cares? Because you have a bullpen, and so it's never incumbent upon you, even if it's in your own self-interest in extending your career, to learn how to pitch to contact. Nope, strike everyone out. So this is what he's saying. One of many things he's yes. saying. Yes, um, and the implication that these skilled fighters are just getting away with winning these fights well, and yeah, are fooling that, people well, in some way. That's the other point, right? Because there's there's this conceit that runs through the story, and the conceit is that these fighters bullshit. And then, uh, like, a, a, a defensive, a good defensive fighter is actually bullshitting people into thinking that he's winning a fight that he's not necessarily winning. Everyone involved. And, and he's just so in love with this idea of BS um, that it kind of, one, it, dis- it sidetracks him uh, from realizing that he doesn't, he can get rid of the whole BS conceit and just say deception, because that's what we're talking right. about. Right. That's what we're talking about. Is that guys like Mayweather, or to a lesser extent Broner, but Broner's very different. We can talk about that. Um, are always winning fights as much as they're tricking you into thinking they're winning fights by fighting so well defensively, um, and that the only criterion is clean, effective punching. But if you're a good defensive fighter your opponent's not going to land as many punches cleanly and effectively. And there are any number of ways to create a deficit between the punch, the clean punches you land and the clean punches you receive. You can just throw more punches or you can say to yourself, oh, hey, wait a minute. Why don't I stop him from landing so many punches and then I'll land more. And, and that's, that's, all, that's also deficit. implying that these great defensive fighters are only playing defense and yes. are sharp, accurate punchers on their own. Yes. Uh, we're getting the rap signal right here on this segment, but I do want to talk about this on the other side of the we break. I think there's going. a whole lot more to get into, and yes. then we'll also talk about uh, Matisse Postel. Uh, we will talk about Roy Jones and Max Kellerman's pound-for-pound pound list, which also came out of that broadcast. Yes. And uh, we love reviewing boxing reality television, so we have to talk about the road to Golovkin Lemieux. Exactly. Plenty more coming up here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you as we continue to look back at Adrian Broner and Habib Alakverdiev from this past weekend. Adrian Broner getting the stoppage victory in the final round. And uh, we're talking about the fallout and the coverage of it yes. since then. In particular, one article uh, written by Connor Rubish over at A Bad Left Hook. Again, full disclosure, uh, the editor, so to speak, of that website, Scott Christ, is a friend of mine. Uh, I think he is an intelligent boxing mind, but he had nothing to do with this article. So if Scott is watching this, I want him yeah, to I know. I, 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 don't know I don't know you. Scott. I just know him via Twitter. Yes. You know, we tweet sometimes. And again, yeah, he seems very sensible. And we don't have to agree on everything. No. But even the stuff we disagree on, it's... Like, it's, okay, you thought that out. It's yeah. well thought out. Where, yeah. Whereas, and this is the point, is that this is overthought. I remember, you know, I used to cover soccer. In the first year, probably eight years ago, Toronto FC was in town. Uh, it was their first season, and there was uh, the Under-20 World Cup was also here in Canada. It's 2007. And what happened is you had a lot of mainstream media, people like me, uh, who hadn't covered soccer before. We weren't coming from a soccer background. Then you had, like, the soccer specialist media. And I remember this one game in Edmonton. Team Canada had lost, I think, to Austria. You know, and there's this uh, guy that runs maybe a, a soccer newsletter or a website. English accent, blonde hair, ponytail, and people are asking, you know, the coach questions in, in the post-game news conference, and he comes with his English accent, and he says, well, it's obvious to anyone who knows soccer that Canada were by far the superior side, <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, wait a minute, Canada just lost 3 nothing. How are they the superior side? But we didn't know anything about soccer. He knew everything about soccer, so he was going to tell us and explain to us how the 
team that lost three nothing was in fact the superior side. And yes. this is this is this is what this article is. He Connor Rubish, God bless him, he loves boxing. Um, but to the extent that he thinks himself into seeing things that aren't happening. Such as Habib winning this fight at the time of the stoppage. Yes. More on that in a second. Uh, but just other past scorecards he turned in, like Pacquiao beating Mayweather 115-113 yes. the first time he scored it. Canelo Mayweather being a draw. Glasgow Cunningham being 117-111 Glasgow. Canelo Mayweather a draw. There's a point where he's explaining his scoring of the Pacquiao Mayweather fight where he says he didn't see the whole fight because his stream dropped or something like that. So then why are you scoring rounds you didn't see or presenting a whole fight scorecard based on not all the rounds. Yeah. Um, you know, and he, and he takes pride in the fact that his scorecards look different from other people's scorecards. Um, That's and, not always good. No, and, it's, and this is not to say that you should just be, you know, a lemming and follow the crowd. Uh, but in something like this, and I, and I understand what he thinks he's doing. I see more than the rest of you. I'm more perceptive. Mm-hmm. But there's there's a point where you cross, from, cross over from being more perceptive to just being a contrarian and because you think you know more about boxing you're just going to pick every pick against what everyone else picks because that's your best way of showing that you know more about boxing and it's you can you can you can know a lot about boxing and express it without being um a condescending contrarian jerk about it like yes i, I don't know Con- conor rubbish i would love to watch the fights with scott chris I don't know. I I can tell you for sure. I wouldn't want to watch the fights. No, no. I don't think we want to hang out. And and, and let me be clear because now you guys can come to our fight parties. We that's are the best fine. people to watch fights. Yeah, with. We, we have a yeah, great absolute time. Absolute best. Absolute best. I you know I I know better than anyone uh, that sometimes you can turn in a scorecard that people disagree with. <laughs> I, I I know that. So because you're on the take. Because I'm on the yeah I'm on the take. You're right. <laughs> but um, you know these are scorecards that he's turning in uh, that are in in. Direct contrast to what everybody else yes. is saying. Not not a not a fight that is divisive, you know, amongst the audience in any way. No, but scorecards that are flatly uh, against what is actually happening. In particular, yes. Broner Habib, where for five rounds, and again, he was watching this fight live. He was in Cincinnati. He says about fifty feet away from the ring. Okay, so. John David Jackson, as we know from watching on television, yes. was thinking about stopping this fight for five rounds previous to the stoppage. Yes. So are you telling me that you knew more that than the corner who is in charge of taking care of the That's fighter exactly what and he's more me. than the fighter who himself got stopped. That's a, listen. And not only, are, uh, no, we're not just coming to that conclusion that that's what he's saying. That's actually what he's saying yes. because if you scroll down into the comments, someone asked him and one of his colleagues, Will Esco, asked him, do you think AB's bullshitting can also influence the opposing corner and the referee? And that's such a facetious question. Yes. The answer to that question should be no. Yeah, it should be no. Yes. But yes, I absolutely Absolutely do of was the answer. How you know? How can they be fooled? Because again, this is the person that he's. I, I get the impression from from reading what he writes that he's used to being the smartest boxing guy in the room. Yes. And the way to express this again is just to disagree with everyone and say, "Oh, you you don't see it because you can't see everything I can see because I'm smarter and more perceptive." Um, to the point where he's gonna watch a fight. And then overrule the guys that are one in the ring, two taking the punches. Yeah, I know you're ready to quit this fight. I know you're bleeding, but you're not really bleeding. You're not really hurt. It's just that you've been BS by Adrian Broner. Right. Well, no, maybe it wasn't the BS. It was the punches. Yeah. Adrian Broner, when he's imitating Floyd Mayweather, is a painfully boring fighter to watch. And he's not very effective because Floyd Mayweather can defend very well, but he's also a counterpuncher. Whereas Adrian Broner is either getting out of the way of your punches, getting hit by your punches, or punching you. But when Adrian Broner fights offensively, he's smart, he's creative, he's yes. compelling. And this is what you saw in the second half of that fight. And so go ask Alec Verdiev if he was being tricked or if he was getting punched in the face. Right. Getting punched in the face or getting tricked into getting punched in the face. Well, and, and listen, Pauly Malignaggi told me, and I, I, we should have had the clip right, but Pauly told me on Friday that Adrian Broner is the best defensive fighter that he ever faced. And, you know, you would think, hey, that's weird because Pauly seemed to get off a lot in that yeah. fight. But he said, no, it was really hard to hit this guy clean. Are you telling me that Pauly is lying? Like the guy that was there feeling his fists in in the body of Adrian Broner was was deceived in he some way, and that you know better. Yes, he just doesn't. If Paulie Malinaji was more perceptive, 
more dedicated to the craft of boxing, he would understand. And and listen, it, we're going to hit the break in about a minute here, but you know, it, it he might be the smartest boxing fan in whatever room he's hanging out with. When you enter this room or boxing Twitter or whatnot, it, that that is not what well, you are. And, and and the other thing like I can tell that he just started watching the sport about like two years ago or something. Right. Just based on what I've seen on, on social media. Remember when he compared Monty Meza Clay to Aaron Pryor? <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember when he said that Manny Pacquiao's defense was derivative of Marlon Starlings? <laughs> you remember that one? How about when he compared Rancis Bartholomew to Salvador Sanchez? These are all guys that he they, like iconic they, fighters that he discovered over the last year. How about they when both he said speak Spanish? Yes. Yeah. How about when he said that Luis Rosa was, was using the catchel shift? New York club fighter Luis Rosa was using the, that something from Stanley Ketchel. It could happen. There, um, there are all kinds of journeyman baseball players that you know borrowed a batting stance from George Brett. Of course. You know? Oh yeah. Well, not just George Brett. If we're talking Stanley Ketchel, they were d- borrowing it from like Turkey Stearns. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I don't think any Ray of this Greenberg. happened. Greenberg. Yes, exactly. Uh, this, this is the last I'm ever going to talk about this article. Uh, go read it if you want to laugh, or don't ever read it. You'll probably be don't smarter. Don't ever read it. Don't, don't ever read the it. The only because Corey just bugged me. He's like, we got to talk about this on the show, and it's only because I did it for the show. I did it for you guys. I read it, so you won't have to. <laughs> Uh, we'll switch gears. We'll talk about the HBO telecast uh, when we come back after the break. Matisse and Postel, and uh, apparently we have a new star. Star is born, so <laughs> to course. speak, in the 140-pound weight class. We'll be right back on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Number Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. We've broken down the Showtime card. Let's move over to HBO from this past weekend. Victor Postel uh, scoring a what some would consider to be a shocking win, or at least a shocking result, in defeating uh, Lucas Matisse, uh, stopping him in the 10th round. Now, uh, we'll get into the idea of quitting and Lucas Matisse in just a second, but the very first thing that I noticed in this fight, Victor Postel comes through the curtain, and what's playing? Simply the Best by Tina Turner. And this is just another example of Eastern Europe's fascination <laughs> with this song and with Tina Turner. When I was when I was calling the World Combat Games, in St. Petersburg, Russia. I had no clue. Tell them. Every single time uh, someone received a medal. Yep. Gold, silver, and bronze. So three times for every weight class, for every single event, in every single sport, they played simply the best. And Victor Postel comes out to simply the best. I guarantee you, every single Eastern European fighter either comes out to the Rocky theme, comes out to simply the best, uh, or we will rock you, or Roy Jones. Can't be touched. There's only well, four songs that they Roy ever Jones, use. Well, as you know, he does he does shows in in Russia. Yes, he, he beat the guy that looked like Bubbles from He's the Wire. A, he is a Russian citizen, uh, which you really notice on these broadcasts, by the way. And well, remember, he, he he beat the guy that looked like Bubbles from the Wire. Yes, and then afterward, he said, "Hey, give me the mic." Right, and started rapping. Started rapping. Yeah, it can't be it touched. became an, it became a number one hit. Uh, Roy Jones loves any fighter from Russia, from Ukraine, yes. from, and ever since he became Russian or was en route to becoming. Russian, Russian, he is a hundred percent in favor of these guys. He yes. loved Victor Postel throughout this show, and it's it's. I like Victor Postel. Now he made, he made me look like a fool because I th- I thought you know as we were saying last week because I don't know that he had the power uh, to hurt Matisse. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm wrong. Yes, you know, and, and he he is a much more um, assertive puncher now than he was a year ago. Uh, now whether or not because the, the first thing they set up. You know, on that broadcast is, hey, we have another star, Bud Crawford. Uh, how would you like to see these two together? Um, Postal looked great against Matisse, but fighting Matisse doesn't tell you a lot about how you're going to do against Bud Crawford, who's a much better boxer um, and much more versatile. Tells you Matisse. almost nothing. It tells you zero. Do. Yeah. It tells you not a thing. But it does tell you that he can he can punch hard enough to get Lucas Matisse out there and make him quit, Morgan. Well, because apparently now, Lucas Matisse is a quitter because if you have an that? eye injury, a, a lots of people. Who said that? You go through boxing Twitter right now, you will find many people saying that Lucas Matisse quit. And I guess they also think, um, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, John Mugabe, when he fought uh, Dwayne Thomas. Yes. Broken orbital bone. John Mugabe, the beast. One of the most ferocious fighters ever. He quit. Quitter. 
Quitter. Oh, we all quitter. Have this what a horrible quitter. Alexis Arguello in yes. the second fight with uh, quitter. Aaron Pryor. Quitter. Yep. Israel Vasquez. M- quitter. Muhammad Eric Ali. Eric Morales. Muhammad Ali quitter. on the stool against yep. Larry. Is, the, is there a Larry Holmes t-shirt around here? No. Nah, not right now. But <laughs> right. Quitter. Here's the thing. When you watch that, watch the replay. Watch the slow motion replay of that punch. You're not gonna. You're not gonna see a guy land a more perfect punch. That was the punch that Adrian Broner was working on in in practice. You know, the step back, the draw. Yeah. Yep. Straight right hand, which always works beautifully against a guy holding pads, but like. In the real world against a professional, very rarely does it present itself to you that cleanly. And he was able to step back and put all the weight on his back foot and put all the weight on his front foot right. and put his whole, it wasn't an arm punch, it was a whole body. And then Matisse moving forward to meet it just increases the impact. So it's not like, you know, he went down from a jab or a left hook to the body or anything like that. Left, left hooks to the body hurt. They hurt, guys. I don't know what business you guys, you think these people are in. Again, when we talked about Mayweather versus Berto, and Berto only landed 83 punches, we thought, man, what a horrible night for Berto. Yeah. Think about this, people. <laughs> when you're a professional boxer, and there's a day in your life that you only get punched 83 times, that's a great day. That's a, I only got hit 83 times today. That's a great day. So uh, where do you get off telling people they quit? If he was a quitter, he would have quit a long time ago. He would have yeah. quit like you most people. never stepped in the ring. Right. Yeah. And it was obvious, too, that um, when Matisse was on his knee... He wasn't just like dazed, like he was in some physical discomfort. There was an injury there. So why get up? Why exactly. get up and keep fighting? Like, I in don't a know, fight you're losing too. I don't know what you people want from a boxer except that someone dies in the ring or is blinded and not blinded over the long term, like right in front of Instantly you. Instantly blinded, yeah. Yes. Oh, perfect. He'll never see again out of that eye. Now I'm satisfied. Um, at this fight that I didn't even pay for cause because I they declare him a Twitter uh, a quitter excuse me until further proof until proven wrong until he says I have a broken orbital bone until proof of what exactly I, I, I don't understand he got hit with the perfect punch yeah. he quit too I will say if we are and we're getting the rap signal on, on this segment if we are going to make light of this in any way I wonder if those uh, NWA not with Al t-shirts <laughs> that included <laughs> Lucas Matisse are those on for like 75% off right now they're going to they're going to just put Victor Postal in there yeah. Yeah, it's going to be like those uh, championship T-shirts from the team that loses. Yes, the the uh, the, the Seattle Seahawks 2015 Super Bowl champion right. T-shirts. They're off going to an orphanage somewhere. Even though, might I add, two of the fighters that were on the original T-shirt, they've lost to Heyman fighters. Lost to Heyman That's fighters. That's all right. They're so. making up a new batch with uh, Postal. Right. Here. So on top of it being inaccurate, inappropriating, and racist, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> all right, we'll be back with more after the break here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Uh, we just talked about Victor Postal and Lucas Matisse. One thing I wanted to touch on, which we sort of alluded to in the broadcast, uh, which to me might be the best talking point from that broadcast entirely, yes. is the pound-for-pound pound list yep. that was revealed from Roy Jones, or at least the number one on their pound-for-pound pound list, yes. for Roy Jones and for Max Kellerman. Now, Max sort of hedged his bet later on by saying he thinks that Andre Ward is number one. Yes. But when Roy Jones came out and said, Vasily Lomachenko is the number one pound for pound fighter in the world, Max Kellerman's immediate response was, I, I agree. Why? And then for a second sort of had to backtrack a little bit, but you could tell that he sort of thinks that or can at least make that argument. You can't make that no. argument. In order to make that argument, you need to forget that he lost to Orlando Salido. And that's not, that's so, not to discredit Lomachenko and how great he is and whatnot, but we clearly want him to be a whole lot better right now, right out of the gate, than he actually so, is. So, yeah, that would make... So if Lomachenko is number one pound for pound, then wouldn't that make Orlando Salido 1A? Or Roman Martinez. Roman Mar- <laughs> yeah, right. would be number one <laughs> right. super champion. And I understand, um, to your point, HBO's desire, you know, on the other side, Showtime's desire uh, to anoint a new top pound for pound, uh, a new top 
pound for pound drop everything and see this guy attraction right now because there's a void at the top of bar in the same way that like all these heavyweights are waiting for Klitschko to retire because there's a void and what happens when this void is created is that all these guys who normally wouldn't get a sniff for the title um, now have a chance to be the champion so now all these guys who good fighters really good fighters but not the star um, we're throwing these names out here hoping one of them sticks and Lomachenko it's a more than a bit of a stretch. Yeah, well, I mean, the the consensus, I think, or the name that is most commonly pinned at the top of that list right now is Chocolatito. Yes. Is Roman Gonzalez, which I, I think is the fairest argument to make out yep. there based on how active he's been recently. I think you can say yes. Andre Ward can be number one, but given that we've only seen him, you right. know, well, even, against Paul Smith recently. Or even Rigondia, who always gets ignored in these discussions and erased from these discussions, hasn't lost... Hits the canvas every now and then, mm -hmm. but hasn't lost. And again, for Rigondia, when he beat um, Donaire, yes, that put him number three pound for pound instantly. Yeah. Yes, it was Mayweather, Ward, Rigo. Yep, Mayweather's gone. Ward, Rigo still hasn't lost, but he's now, plummeting slowly he's plummeting, in, in, in his and, rankings, and, and 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 not from having lost, right? But just from having been inactive because his promoter didn't want to promote right him. And, and, and the same arguments that you would make about Lomachenko are very much there with 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 Rigo yes you know you if you were to say that Lomachenko is anywhere in that in that top 10 you do so based on his amateur pedigree yes uh, perceived level of skill perceived. Uh, perceived advantages against other guys in and yes. around his weight class uh, or mythical matchups if they were yes. all the same because and the, Rigo has the same thing yes and, except he's proven them the argument because and he's proven them and he hasn't lost and you know and the argument they always make is that well this guy who is he beaten in his prime well who what, what elite fighters is Lomachenko beaten in his prime and this is not the same thing against Lomachenko this is just to say that to anoint him the pound for pound king is premature because sure. he still has people he needs to beat we've touched on this on, on Twitter in the past but it is an interesting time in boxing because uh, we've, we've said this but this is the first time since pound for pound became a thing yes uh, really when the question of who the best fighter in the world is uh, it, the answer isn't very obvious oh, it's wide open because the lineage has basically gone from uh, you know Julio Cesar Chavez Mike Tyson Pernell Whitaker yep. uh, Roy Jones Jr. And then basically, you know, there was like an Oscar De La Hoya period. Yeah. Maybe to Shane Mosley, where, where it was sort of up in the air a little bit. Yes. And then straight to Manny and Floyd. Yes. And that's it. There's never been a question like this. Now you can make, like, I don't think you can make the argument for Lomachenko. No, you yet. can make the argument for, for Chocolatito, for Andre Ward, uh, for other guys. I've seen people make it even for Vladimir Klitschko. These are all arguments that you can make, but we really haven't seen this time period since this list became a thing that we talked about. No, and, and you know, the next person people are going to start agitating for is um, your man, Gennady Golovkin. Yes. And I think he deserves a higher place on that list than Vasily Lomachenko. And, and, and as you mentioned last week, uh, there is this kind of tendency to speak of, one, all people from the former Soviet Republic, <laughs> from, the, from all people from former Soviet republics as Russian. Yes. And then to speak of them as all one person, as if they're not distinct individuals. Right. So we can just talk about Lomachenko, Postal, uh, <laughs> Alexander, Alexander Usyk, <laughs> whoever you want to throw out there, yep. As interchangeable, and they're not. Um, so but Golovkin um, actually does probably have a, a more legitimate claim for a spot at the top or near the top of pound for pound than um, Lomachenko does. No disrespect to Lomachenko, but this is professional boxing. There's just more. There are more people he has to beat before we can say this is the absolute best professional boxer in the world. Uh, speaking of Golovkin, uh, yes. he finally got the boxing reality show treatment, yes. although only in a 15-minute format, uh, <laughs> as, as HBO presented uh, the road to Golovkin Lemieux. Yes. Uh, what I, my, I mean, my takeaway. And it wasn't really a takeaway for me because as people who have been in the in the Canadian boxing scene, I've gotten to know David Lemieux yep. uh, over the years. I sort of know what he's all about. David Lemieux is infinitely more interesting to me than Gennady Golovkin. David hey. Lemieux is a guy who knows seven languages, seems to be a wonderful chef. Yes. And is a pretty thoughtful speaker when you when you plug, when you you clip the microphone onto him. Yes. That's way more interesting to me than the tired uh, Golovkin are... stuff. Like, you brought up Munori Kawasaki, by the way, and yes. that, towered, that tired joke, that is the same 
same thing as people setting up Triple G to say he's a good boy. Yes, and, and I'm so tired of that, man. And here and now here, and th- we started the show with people taking arrogant Adrian Broner and trying to make him boring because they think boring is better for some reason. Now you have Gennady Golovkin, who's an, an exciting fighter, but by all indications, a painfully boring human being. And they're trying anything to make this guy seem interesting. They took the, if you watch the the, the episode, you know, they take the, the, the tram to the top of the mountain. Yeah. And they say, look at this. Isn't he fascinating? He likes scenic views. Well, who doesn't like scenic views? That doesn't make him unusual there's also just the top of a ski hill yeah. it isn't even like a thrilling place no. to be or anything like that <laughs> like, hey guys let's get on the top of the ski lift and, uh, okay we're here now all right yeah right? and they there's cut no to, snow they cut to abel sanchez yeah he really really likes uh the serenity yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the other thing about they're trying hard to promote the guy i'll give them that of course um there's a there's a professional wrestling there's a Kurt Hennig feel to this where <laughs> yes for you guys that are old enough to remember uh, Mr. Perfect when he first came to the world it was the World Wrestling Federation back then and they cut all these promos and he would just be playing every sport perfectly because he was Mr. Perfect so he would throw the football catch it himself uh, he, he ran the table in, in pool he played against Mike Modano in <laughs> hockey yes. he was a net just <laughs> yes so here we have uh Gennady Golovkin and his his buddies. For some reason, there's like a, a driveway basketball hoop, or as Ludacris would call it on Empire, a basketball goal. <laughs> there's a basketball goal, and they're trying to hit like seated three point shots. So shirtless, sitting, yes, shirtless, shirtless, fully transvanted, shirtless, sitting on the ground trying to three point set shot with two hands, seated, and no one can do it except Golovkin, who comes, sits down, seated. Hits the, the three-point set yes. shot from his bum. But th- this is too By easy. the way, there's also the implication in that scene, even with the narrator, I forget the line, but there's the implication that he just sits down and gets it on the first try. Yes. Except you can visibly see when the cut happens. <laughs> yes. Clearly, he took more no. than a few shots. No, listen, hey, listen. <laughs> if you start implying that these uh, reality TV shows are edited or staged in any way, don't let Dan Rayfield find out because he will tweet... Oh, I mean, tweet a furious. storm at you. By the way, what did we tell you two episodes ago on this very show? A boxing reality show can't happen without a backyard barbecue for yes. your supporters. There's David Lemieux, grill master, yes. who seems to be cooking up fairly intricate uh, Lebanese dishes for yes. his daughter earlier on, single dad David Lemieux, and is then also grill master cooking filet mignon and some skewers for some, some people as well. Yes. You have to have that. There needs to be that scene <laughs> in every single boxing reality TV show. They lost the coin toss. They're like, hey, listen, when do you got a barbecue, man? Yes. Because imagine if uh, Golovkin had lost that coin coin toss and he had the barbecue what would he make right what would he make Lemieux just happened to be this great chef well it wouldn't be as good as Ruslan Pavonikov who doesn't barbecue anything remember he just eats raw meats <laughs> like raw seal that's for, and uh, whatnot in, why don't we get that scene enhanced bioavailability that's right yeah you know, the, <laughs> the, the nutrients go straight into your cell your cells <laughs> And you don't cook it. Oh, oh man. man. All right. Uh, on the other side of the break, we're going to touch on uh, Joel Diaz, now training Ruslan Provodnikov. Speaking of Ruslan, yes. we're also going to talk about the KO king of Korea, Randall Bailey, who's on the comeback trail. That and plenty more when we come back on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Before we continue with anything else, yep. uh, anyone who's on boxing Twitter right now, Shane Mosley needs your help. Shane Mosley is trying to win his girlfriend back, and he needs everyone's help. And apparently the advice that he's getting right now isn't sufficient, and it's it's caused Shane now to threaten a Twitter sabbatical, which I can't have. I can't I'm in full, live in I'm, that I'm, world. I am in full support of a Shane Mosley Twitter <laughs> sabbatical. Someone should have taken Shane Mosley's Twitter from him a long time ago. Shane Mosley tweeted... Uh, oh, I hope this thing pulls up. Shane Mosley tweeted at... Oh, you know, he's deleting Oh, he tweets. deleted the tweets. Okay. He, we have, I, I took screen caps of those. So Shane Mosley got smart. Yes. So basically, uh, well, at one point, he tweeted, uh, well, he, uh, within, the, within the contents of his tweet, put his yes. girlfriend in there saying, how do I win at whoever back? She's smart. She's sexy. She's beautiful. She's such a hard worker. How do I get her back? 
And I'm just I'm reading these with Lenny Williams <laughs> in, in the background, <laughs> basically. But now he's just lost and he's furious. Uh, he basically he directly said "f you" to everybody and has now vanished. Well, what did he do? I don't know, but it's his Twitter feed has gotten increasingly bizarre and sad. Yes, more and more sad. And the saddest one, by the way, before we continue, there was one guy. So yesterday he was giving away signed gloves for charity, right? Yes. So one guy apparently um, paid for one of these charity gloves. Yes. And three times he said robbers took the package before it got to his house. So Shane mailed him four gloves. This guy's clearly hoodwinking Shane into sending him four gloves for the price of one. That is nuts. And he keeps sending these gloves. And remember Shane? And robbers didn't take four no. gloves. And Shane had kept tweeting too about um, his house getting broken into. Yes. But this is, and here's the thing about Shane and like, Feuding with your exes in in public, right? Because Shane has used Twitter to lob all kinds of bombs at his ex, at Jen. Talk all kinds of trash about Jen. And then use social media to say, look how happy I am with my my new girlfriend. Um, You can't then. Because you've made this social media. You've you've made social media the platform, the arena for this. So And you want your ex to pay attention and now your ex okay I'll follow you on Twitter Shane and see what's happening and now she's seeing you beg for some girl that not only that left you but you screwed up Mm -hmm. so it's not like she left and you can say yeah you know what good rinse because she screwed up she did me wrong I screwed up and now you've you've already drawn your ex's attention to your plight and so now there's there's nowhere to go from there. Like he is no. fully in the the no shame zone. And not to mention, like a day ago, he tweeted like pantsless selfies of him laying in bed with her. Clearly, there are other photos like on her phone. Yes. That if he did screw up in a serious way, are going to make their way to the internet probably in the next forty eight hours. Yes. And things are going to get a whole lot worse for Shane Mosley. Yeah, and I don't. And, and I'm just trying to figure out where it went wrong for him because when you think about. You know, what we thought of Shane Mosley 15 years ago, you know, when he beat Oscar De La Hoya, he was Mr. Everything That's Right with boxing. Yep. His family's around. He's photogenic. Yep. Trained by his dad. And he wears sweaters. To be nuts. Yeah, just like Gennady Golovkin, you put a sweater on a fighter. <laughs> right. Automatic fan favorite. And the thing about Shane Mosley, too, is that his reputation survived Balco. Like, here's a guy that was working with Victor Conti. So yeah, hey, no, sorry. Shane will tell you he didn't say, "Hey, give me the EPO." Right. That that Conti's people said, "Hey, man, take this. It'll be good for you." And it was EPO. Take this cream. But yeah, but his reputation survived that. But he's doing everything he can uh, to make sure that you know in two years, no one respects him and everyone just kind of pities him. Uh, speaking of significant others, sort of getting involved in things, uh, Joel Diaz yes. makes the somewhat unusual move to now train Ruslan Provodnikov after he has parted ways with Timothy Bradley. Now, Provodnikov, you would think, is Bradley's what would you would you say greatest rival, toughest fight toughest he's ever fight had in, in his career. So now Diaz is training him, and in the process of interviewing about why he made this move, he basically said that Bradley, who was managed by his wife, uh, he was not able to communicate with his fighter in the manner that he thought he could, and and sort of you know qu- quietly lobbed shots at Bradley's wife, and that just. It never, ever ends well. You can't do that. You can't do that. It doesn't matter how close you are either. Exactly. Right? That's his wife. Yeah, it doesn't That's matter. That's the person he chose and who chose him. And the thing is, even if Yoel Diaz is right, you still can't do that. No, you can't. She could be the worst, either the worst wife or the worst, worst manager mm-hmm. or both. But the fact that she has both those jobs at the same time, because you can't even preface it with like, hey, man, I love your wife as a person, but she's a crappy manager. Right. There's no right. getting around it. Like Bradley's going to take it personally, and there's going to be a a, a, a split. And, and, and it's clear that that was the issue because the other day on Instagram, Bradley posted like a picture of a Louis Vuitton uh, like chest filled with a fake fifteen point six million dollars or whatever, saying like, "Look at what my manager has done for me." You know, I love you and whatnot. So clearly, this was the issue. Otherwise, he would never Wait, come out well, and say what things was like the this. Fifteen point six million. That is apparently the amount of money was that it, he has made while she it, has been his manager. Was it cash. It was, was fake, fake cash, yes. So, like, 
the thing that Adam Jones should have known existed? Did he go to the to the movie prop store? Correct. And get all this fake Correct. money and say, you could learn from the Desert Storm Instagram. Yes. <laughs> we have just a couple of minutes left. We got to hit the break. We'll be right back with more of Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman, Morgan Campbell here with you. We have about like a minute 20 left. Yep. Well, we did want to say welcome back to Randall Bailey, who is now the KO King of Korea because he is now stationing his career in Korea. Oh, he's moved there. He's basic, well, he has like a promoter or a manager of sorts that is now in Korea. He made uh, his debut in Korea, scoring a knockout, of course. And I, I don't know, he must be paid fantastically well because if you watch the footage and it's out there on YouTube, he's the knockout and then clearly they paid for like five members of his squad to be there yes so they must be overpaying Randall Bailey to an extraordinary degree and I say congratulations yeah, to you Randall and they, Bailey and that's money that they saved on facility rentals because the fight appears to be taking place in a high school auditorium but can we welcome him back I don't feel like Randall Bailey's ever really left. no and I don't think he he's ever just will gone underground no he's never gonna retire he's 41 well, well just got a knockout. He can knock out guys in Korea for the rest of his life. He could. And when he gets to the point where he can't knock out Koreans, he can go to Hungary. And when he can't knock out the Hungarians, he can go to Latvia. He can do this probably until about 51. I think you and I need to go to Latvia if this ever comes to a, to an end. <laughs> if, I, if I ever need the cash, I know where I'm going uh, for a quick payday. <laughs> All right. That about does it for this episode of Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Ring the bell, Morgan. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. Yes. Yes.